Greetings! Today we begin once again the long trek to Arizona and I've decided to leave the Florida RV Super Show in Tampa, Florida one day early so I can arrive in Quartzsite, Arizona by Friday and still be able to visit Jason and Misty in San Antonio. He's invited me to fly in his Cessna around the city and hill country and that's just an offer I can't refuse. So, the 2300 mile long trip can be done in roughly 5 days, but we're gonna take 6. And San Antonio is pretty much exactly at the halfway point, so this is gonna work out great. Now buckle up and sit back, because we're going almost the whole way cross country and it is going to be a long drive, especially the first half. Riding in my RV, my RV, wherever I want to be. Cause I'm free in my RV. Yeah. Well, good morning. Greetings from the Florida RV Super Show. And today I'm wearing my Lewis and Clark uh, shirt because just like Lewis and Clark, well, not just like Lewis and Clark, but. Uh, today we begin the 2021 Conquest of the West. Why do I say the first half will be longer? Well, at least it is going to feel longer. Interstate 10 is straight and flat for the most part. That is until we get to Hill Country, Texas. make myself some breakfast because I didn't have breakfast this morning. I'm trying try to make it as brief as, as possible and I did turn on the, the heat because I mean it's there's still a little bit of a chill in the air. It's probably in the 50s but still. Whoa. Don't you hate when that happens when you open the fridge and stuff starts falling off. Ugh. I'm glad that this didn't break. That, that would have been a mess. I'm just gonna cut this and um, and fry it there a little bit and then add the sofrito mix and then add eggs yeah it is going to be a late breakfast almost lunch of kielbasa sausage and eggs with frozen onions and peppers Came up with this great idea. Let's add some cheese. Yep, it is I-10, all right. And aside from the rolling hills by the Tallahassee area, there is really nothing exciting until we hit Pensacola. As we cross the Apalachicola River, we are now in the central time zone. And the good thing about driving west is that you gain an hour every 900 miles or so at our current latitude, which is roughly 30 degrees north. As we drive across Scambia Bay, we are now arriving in Pensacola. The Alabama state line will be coming soon, thus finishing our second longest state of the trip. The longest drive across the state will be Texas, of course. Driving to the west, into the sunset, driving to the west. Driving to the west, into the sunset, driving to the west. Welcome to Alabama. We are not in Texas, not yet, but there's a Bucky's. There's the now familiar Mobile skyline as we begin driving across the northern part of Mobile Bay.
Welcome to Mississippi. Oh, thank you. Mississippi, the birthplace of American music. Our stop for the night. Hello, Pelican Heads, and good morning. It, it is 36 degrees Fahrenheit, so I'll be brief. This is where I spend the night here at the Mississippi Welcome Center. Not officially an overnight uh, uh, camping spot, but no one bothered me here. This is like the, the picnic area. Uh, it's, it's towards the back of the of the rest area, and that's like the truck section. And the car section is on the other side. So I was the only RV overnighting here at this uh, picnic area. It is the crack of dawn. And today, uh, the plan is to, to drive all the way to Katy, Texas. And I'm going to be mooch docking uh, there with uh, some viewers. Uh, and then on to San Antonio and, uh, and beyond. And uh, my weather app says uh, that it went down to 36 degrees. But uh, I bet to differ. It froze last night. Look at that. Yay. On the road again. Crossing the Pearl River, we are now in Louisiana. This used to be one of the best welcome centers. Super friendly and helpful staff and great complimentary coffee, but I believe it is currently closed. As of January 2021. We are now in Louisiana and uh, this rest area used to offer free coffee. Let's, let's see if they still do. Here they have the sign and if you recall the last time I was here I took a picture with this sign with the shape of the state of Louisiana which is shaped like an L of course but I had never realized there was a pelican. Well, check it out, here's another pelican. Fly pelican! Oof, it's cold, I can't even say it. It's cold and early. And, uh, hmm, I just realized Louisiana is also known as the Pelican State. Welcome center closed. Oh well, I was looking forward to the free coffee. Really looking forward to it. They had pretty good coffee in there too. Yeah, I still have one of my tires that is not giving me a signal here. And uh, it's probably the battery. I should have been smart and changed all the batteries uh, when I did. Was it yesterday or the day before? I'm gonna have to do it now. It's supposed to have like an anti-theft uh, device, but you can really get them out without the anti-theft device. <laughs> and this TPMS is great, except that changing the battery is a little bit of a pain in the ass. It's not as easy as previous ones because of that anti-theft uh, uh, device that it has you have to remove these three screws and they are very tiny screws they're like like you know like eyeglass screws and i don't have that type of screwdriver but i realized that if i could only find it i could never find anything in this drawer but i found the batteries i couldn't find it because i put it in the wrong drawer so i found out that the swiss army knife if you use, use the fine knife you can change the battery and according to Eric from Techno RV, you can actually operate the TPMS without this uh, anti-theft enclosure. And Techno RV, of course, I'm an affiliate, so if you decide to buy something like this from Techno RV, always remember to use my link, travelingrobert.com slash Techno RV. All right, once you get these three little screws out, it's just a matter of separating these two. It's usually easier. And then inside, it's kind of stuck. Oh, I know why it is. Oh, there you go. You know what? It's full of sand from three different deserts since I've been around so, so much. And then you need the, the other two. And this one I believe I saw here. Yeah. This one you do need. And this is the tool you're supposed to use to, to remove them uh, from, you know, 
with the anti-theft device and then you just unscrew them and they're so full of sand that you know it's hard to, to get them out so here we go change the battery on this one is this it so yeah 1632 yeah this is the TST system which is really nice I like it it's very reliable but yeah, they, they recommend that you change the batteries once a year, and it's definitely been over a year. So yeah, you, you could just put this on the valve stem and that's it, but then uh, there, there's this enclosure that makes it uh, theft proof or theft deterrent, I would say at the very least. But yeah, sometimes you have to improvise. And I've had this Swiss Army knife since. Whew. Probably early 90s. Let me put it in the proper drawer. Now let's put this back on the on the valve stem and see if it works. And the way the anti-theft works, you know, if you keep spinning, it'll keep spinning. So you just have to make sure that it gets tight. There it is. You saw it? Now that tire is detected. 41, it's supposed to be 44, so it is a little low. But it's uh, the temperature, and uh, I'll, I'll put some air at some point. Just 41, and uh, according to Winnebago, it's supposed to be 44 psi. I was really looking forward to my Louisiana coffee. Thank you, COVID. Continue for half a mile. For the next portion of the trip, we're going to take I-12 in order to bypass New Orleans. But unless you're going to one of the state parks in the area, it is pretty much a dreadful drive. And no rest areas until after Baton Rouge. What's up with that, Louisiana? No rest areas, really? 207 per gallon, 202 with my good Sam discount. Cheapest gas of the whole trip so far. I did see a gas station back there, somewhere, that had like 201 or 195, some, somewhere in, in Mississippi, but I didn't need to put gas in Mississippi. By the way, that's a pretty cool looking bounder and an old bounder. Those were cool motorhomes. Yeah. Many uneventful miles later, here we are, Baton Rouge, the state capital, and pretty soon we're going to cross the mighty Mississippi. We cross the Mississippi, we encounter the Atchafalaya, the largest wetland and swamp in the United States. And we are going to drive across it on the Atchafalaya Basin Bridge, the third longest in the United States. So we are of the Atchafalaya and uh, wow, it looks like they fixed this part of the road. I mean, maybe I'm speaking too soon, but well, maybe it's farther down. The part, the part is like da 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 until you get to Texas. We still have a long way to go. So. Yeah, I spoke too soon. The road is getting worse. Listen, do you hear it? It's like taka 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 taka. What? And this is the thing. This, this piece of road here has been under construction since the first time I drove through here in, in early 2018. And I don't see any improvement. I mean, how long does it take to, to pave or fix the piece of road? It's right here, Broadbridge. I stayed at this uh, Walmart here in Broadbridge. Here's the, the, the pilot that has a casino. I'm sure by the time they finish, it is going to be great. Well, you see, some parts are a little better. So by 2030, I guarantee this is gonna be finished. Beautiful. Approaching Lake Charles, we can see some evidence of damage from Hurricane Laura. 
which made landfall in August of 2020. There is the bridge over the Calcasú River, which in reality is not as steep as it looks from afar. Seems to be some kind of optical illusion. Yeah, you can definitely tell the, that a hurricane came through here. Hurricane Laura. It is a pretty impressive bridge nonetheless, especially the descent on the other side, towards what looks like an industrial dystopia. And we've finally made it to Texas, the Lone Star State. Well, yeah, we're making an excellent time. Just made it to Texas. And uh, we've been here before, but let me show you real quick. By the way, beautiful day here in the, in the Lone Star State. Speaking of Lone Stars, that's a big Lone Star right there. And the Texas sign is all the way back there. I was gonna take a picture, but I've taken a picture before. Today I'm gonna take a picture with the Lone Star. And here we have a cutaway map of the Lone Star State. Of course we are somewhere around here. And we're gonna go all the way and exit through here. Over the way here we also have the six flags of Texas. Very important. I spent about an hour at the Travel Information Center and now it's all cloudy. And here's my favorite sign coming up. El Paso, 857 miles. It gives you an idea of the sheer size of the state. And that's how I came up with my unit of measurement describing my maximum daily distance as half a Texas, roughly 420 miles. I'm gonna stop for gas and here in Baytown is the first Bucky's I ever saw. And I was understandably impressed. It is definitely a Texas-sized gas station. Approaching Houston. And this is one of those metropolitan areas that it seems endless. But luckily, we are getting close to our stop for the night. I'm gonna be much docking with Jose and Yvette in Katy, which is towards the western end of this massive metropolis. Take it out. Right. Oh, I'm tired. <laughs> oh, I bet, man. I, you know, it's just... Robert, welcome home, man. Well, super cool hanging out with Jose and Yvette uh, last night and this morning. You know, they let me mush dog. They fed me. They got me IPAs. I mean, what else could you ask for? And um, very nice. Now I, now I have some new friends here in Katy, Texas. How about that? There's another Bucky's here, so I'm going to top off the tank and get some breakfast. Went into Bucky's, of course. Here's what I've got. I got some fudge, because that's what you do. I got some sausage. We've got ribeye steak for one of these days. And I got me two tacos because I want to sample, you know, the local cuisine. This one is a hippo taco. And this one is a, um, a true brisket egg taco. Oh no, it's starting to fall apart. Mmm, that egg is so tasty. Well, 
but this one has beans too. And that's what it was. Lots of construction going on in Texas. These almost unnoticeable rolling hills are a good sign. That means we're getting closer. It's starting to look like hill country. After catching up for a little bit and checking the weather, Jason decided to go for it. So to the airfield we go. We're at Bernie Stage Airfield and so we're gonna see what we can do. I mean, we got some low-hanging clouds, um, but if we can get up in the air and, and maybe get a couple of turns around and, and stay underneath the clouds, then, yeah. then we'll try to, you know? Right, um, sounds like fun, man. But we'll see what happens. <laughs> so this is hangar three where I, keep the, where I keep the Cessna, and we'll open her up and see what the airplane looks like and what Check it's going to Check it out, say. yeah. Absolutely, man. Look at that. There she is. Let's get it up. If we need to, we can we can always file IFR and just do a local IFR flight, you know, and just talk mm -hmm. to San Antonio approach controllers and, and keep it cool like that, you know. This here basically gives us everything that, that we need to check for on the airplane. Mm -hmm. So okay. it goes from pre-flight to before start, start, run up, take off, climb, cruise, before landing, after landing, and securing the airplane. Stepping inside, we make sure that the gear selector, because this is a complex airplane, this gear is actually retractable. Mm -hmm. So gear handle is down. We'll take a look at the tack hobs. We'll make a note of that once we get on board. We'll check the controls to make sure that they're free. Nothing sticking. Emergency equipment, we got first aid, first aid kit here, and the fire extinguishers in the back, light on the back, and then we should have a red light on over here. I'll also drop the flaps, check the travel through here, check the brackets, whatnot, all up in here. So everything is, there. there's, there's a lot of digital in this airplane. Uh, a few gauges are still analog for backup, but you'll see that everything is very digital in here. So all of our engine what, controls, what is this? this is a 1982 model. 1982, but you replaced the... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all of this stuff has been upgraded, absolutely. Yeah. So we check our fuel, we've got full fuel from our last flight. Our flaps are back up. I can hear the avionics fan, that's audible. And then I'll go around to the other side and hit the master switch. And we'll take the elevator and we'll give it a, a, a nice easy push just to make sure it has full travel. I like to look at the, uh, the locking washers and stuff in here. Make sure that everything's nice and tight. These are cowl flaps. This has a big six cylinder motor on it, Robert. Mm -hmm. So this has external cooling. So I can manipulate these flaps here from the inside. And what this does is if we, if we close them, it will keep more heat on the cylinders. Mm -hmm. So as you fly higher, you want your cylinders to stay nice and warm. Mm -hmm. So we'll close those. But when you're flying down at low altitude, like in the middle of the summer, yeah, you want you maximum to... cooling across that big engine up here. And so we leave them open, or at least I do. You know, it's technique, mm -hmm. really, whatever you want. Propeller's tight. This is a constant speed propeller, Robert. So mm -hmm. whenever we're up in the air, we can actually change gears. It's like shifting gears in a car. Mm -hmm. So we can change the pitch of the propeller to where we can serve more energy and have a lower RPM. This is the weather radar pod here. It doesn't fire missiles. Lots of people. Uh, <laughs> I get so many questions about this, you know, what, what this yeah, is. But this is a weather radar pod. Really so again, we can look at weather on the inside of the airplane. Um, you'll see yes. it on the GPS. And then I also have uh, an actual live weather uh, scope in there as well. Mm -hmm. So you can see what's going on with all of these clouds and stuff, you know. It was really set up as a, as a nice cross-country machine for, for Misty and I to, to fly all over, you know, with it. Well, in the spirit of brevity, I may not show you the whole pre-flight. Suffice to say, Jason is going meticulously through every item on the list, and I might release an uncut version of this if you are interested. This, this holds 88 gallons of fuel. 
and you can go typically if your <laughs> your range is your bladder <laughs> well, okay. you know but you can go five five and a half hours you know depending okay. on your altitude mm -hmm. that you're flying at tailwinds headwinds but typically per the book five five and a half hours but i typically won't fly any more than yeah. three mm -hmm. Three is typically you don't have a bathroom in there, of course. Yeah, no bathroom on board, <laughs> you know, uh, maybe a Gatorade bottle <laughs> if you're really desperate. <laughs> so, pre flight is complete, airplane is good, um, and we'll get ready to pull her out. I have personally always found aviation fascinating. The more I hear, the more I realize how cool it is to have a plane. Well, as Jason is getting ready to pull the plane out, there's a small jet taxiing on the runway, about to take off. So let's check that out. Let me tell you, private aviation seems to be such a cool world. Not dealing with TSA, taking off your shoes or anything like that. I am sure there are other difficulties, not to mention the skills required, but man, it seems so cool. So that's how you do it. More manual than I was expecting, but very efficient. Well, this is really cool, isn't it? And I suppose some of those houses across the runway, they have their own hangar. Wouldn't that be cool? To egress the aircraft, uh, you take this handle, pull it straight up, and then push out. Okay? Mm -hmm. To secure the aircraft, I'll help you do this for you here. You'll notice that we're, we're tight locked and latched here, but what I'm going to ask you to do with your right hand is push that down all the way to lock. All right. All right. And then just like, beautiful, just like grandpa's old car, to put the window in, slide yeah. in. Uh, yep. Got it. Clear right, clear front, clear to the left. Clear front. warm up, let the GPS system and everything find uh, uh, find itself. While I'm doing, while I'm waiting for all of this to, to get in sync, I'm loading up our, our flight plan on the chart here, which basically just has us going across San Antonio out to the Stinson VOR, and then we're going to turn around and come back. Right. You know, uh, I filed for 2,000 feet, so that may have us in and out of the clouds. We'll see how it goes. Um, what's neat about this airplane is it's... Uh, fully equipped for IFR instrument flying. Uh, I'll turn on the weather radar here in just a minute. We've got autopilot here as well. So we're gonna fly on the autopilot so we can kind of relax a little bit and at the same time uh, chat about the flight and let you do some camera work and, and, and whatnot for what we do get to see, yeah. you know. Uh, and then on the way back, we we'll see what happens, you know. We might have to come down and shoot a little bit of the approach before we break out and we'll do our thing. All right. So, Sounds like so it's found us here, so I'm going to go ahead and put in the flight plan. We're going to go over to the Stinson VOR, which is out south of town. And then we're going to return right back to 5 Charlie 1, which is our airport here, Bernie Stage Field. So you'll see these two instruments talk to one another. This is the Aspen 1000. It's the uh, PFD uh, primary flight display. So this gives me airspeed, altitude, attitude, direction. Uh, and then it talks to the GPS over here, which this is the Garmin 750. In turn, that also talks to our autopilot down here. So the autopilot takes commands from the GPS and from the, from the primary flight display. So, like, like I was saying a little earlier, when Misty and I fly cross-country, uh, as soon as we're wheels up, you know, the gear's retracted and we're on our flight plan, you know, uh, I can either turn by heading knob up here to steer the aircraft if I'm on radar vectors with the San Antonio approach, or I can uh, uh, push the navigation button down here and then it will track back to the magenta line and it will follow the entire flight plan. All right. Great. Let's do our run-up. Seatbelt secure. Cabin door is locked and latched. Flight controls are free and correct. 
Autopilot is on. Flight instruments checked and set. Fuel quantity check. We're full of fuel. Mixture is rich. Fuel selectors on both. And we'll go ahead and throttle up to 1700 RPMs. What we're doing now is we're basically checking the engine that it is that it is sound and, and ready to fly. So we're going to offer some RPMs, about 1700, and we do a mag check over here to make sure that we have good uh, magnetos with our with our spark plugs. So we look for a gradual drop on the RPMs when we take when we take some spark away from the left side, and then uh, again again we look for the same as we take some spark away from the right side. And what that is is that's a redundant system. Okay, so say we lose the, the right side magnetos, that we still got the left side magnetos to where we can continue our flight and get to an airport and land in the event of an emergency, right? Okay. Otherwise, if we have no spark on the engine, yeah, that's the engine shuts off and we turn into a streamlined brick. Yeah. Shouldn't say streamlined brick, it'll glide for, it'll glide really well. Okay. Now what I'm doing is I'm just cycling some oil up into the prop hub. So we're going to, uh, he's got IFR going out. Do a quick break check. Yep. And we're going to be number two. Uh, we're not going to be able to stay at 2,000 feet because there's too much traffic around the area. So we're going to climb up to 5,000 and uh, we'll end up having to shoot probably an instrument approach to come back in. But that's okay. Yeah, what's that? This is called the, the Stratus and what that is is an ADSB receiver. And what that does is that's projecting weather and traffic, other airplanes, into the iPad. Over here to the iPad. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And so. That's convenient. Oh yeah. Once we. Uh, but those that that will be precipitation right there. All the uh -huh. dots. Yeah. Yep. Well, also yep. once we get up in the air a little bit, you'll see it projected on on the screen here as well. Off we go! This is so exciting, not to mention fascinating, sitting here inside the cockpit, looking at all the gauges and instruments and trying to learn as much as possible. All set? All set. Traveling Robert is now flying Robert. Yeah. <laughs> Flaps up. San Antonio approach, Skyway 4953 Tango, just off the burning stage. Climbing through 1,500 for 3,000. Number 4953 Tango, San Antonio departure, I dent, climb and maintain, 4,000. Up to 4,000, 4953 Tango. We're in the clouds. Yes, sir, we are IFR. Still climbing. Picking up a little rain. Left to 180, 5 through Tingham. Over 5 through Tango, area of uh, moderate precipitation starts about your 11 o'clock and goes. Uh, further to your east. I'm going to let you run on that southbound heading before I uh, put you on course to New York. Much that. I appreciate it. 400 faster tanker. Coming up on 4,000. Approach. Uh, pretty soupy. Yep. Pretty I soupy. I can see it there at the radar. Yep. <laughs> I see. I see some of the layers up there. Yep. Okay, there's oh. more. Some different layers over there yeah. as well. There you go. Yeah. I forgot to start the uh, the camera on the tail. 
Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, well. But I started it now, so we'll have it now. We'll, we'll have it for, for landing. I'm sure you'll figure, figure out something to yeah. do with it. Five three tango traffic at your three miles uh, headed eastbound at a six thousand for five thousand is a Texan for Kelly. Uh, five three tango's IFR at this time. Uh, we'll keep a lookout for it on TCAS. So what she's doing is she's giving us a traffic advisory for this airplane right here okay. as it's crossing our path, eleven hundred feet above us. Okay. So what's neat? Well, it just cleared off, but with that stratus up there, it will give us that traffic, and as you can see it, it's actually right here. Right there, okay, I see it, yeah. Yep. There we go, there's some ground. We can see a little bit down there now. Yep. This is all South San Antonio back here. What's that freeway there? That's will be I think. That's uh, probably Interstate 35. Let me look at the section here real quick. Yeah, that's 35 running that way. 35, 35 South. So the, if you look here at the sectional, you can see we're getting ready to fly over Kelly Air Force Base. Right here. So what I like to do is they have the cheapest airplane fuel in town, so I come over here to fuel up and then go back up to Bernie. I really wish the downtown area was more clear because then we could do a city tour around the Tower of Americas and all the stuff that you got to see on your summer trip, you know, over here. That's the Air Force Base right down below us. I know it's the cowl is kind of, let me, maybe I can get a little bit of this for you. There's a lot of airplanes that are parked down here due to COVID and whatnot, you know, they had all the ramp space available. And so there's just lots of airplanes sitting down here. The active Air Force side, those planes are down there on your side of the airport, and then all the civilian uh, airliners are sitting down here on my side. There we go. There we got the San Antonio downtown area. Yeah, you can see it down there. Maybe I can zoom in with this you one. You might be able to zoom in with that one. If I could there find it. Oh, oh, I see it. I see it. I'll lean up here so you can try to get a zoom shot. I got it. That's good. I see the tower. Yeah, that would be the Tower of America is where you went up into. So yeah. The climb turn to the left now heading of zero seven zero vector. Uh, that was cool. Get to see it. Yeah, we finally get to see it. Change in runway flows. Uh, Six miles from the VOR. Once we get back and get landed, I think we'll have to go to Rudy's Barbecue, I think. Grab some, grab some brisket and some sausage. 
The plan, if we had beautiful weather, I wanted to take you all the way up to Llano, Texas, and there's Cooper's Pit Barbecue up there, which Rudy's is really good as well. It's becoming a little more commercialized over the years, uh, but I'm going to take you to the original Rudy's there. They're off of I-10 in Leon Valley, and it's nice. They've got the big pit smoker inside the, the restaurant. It's an old gas station. I mean, it's super good. I mean, excellent food. What that is, I'm just briefing the uh, the approach plate to myself so that we're you know mentally mentally prepared for uh, for the approach back into Bernie stage. I swear I don't talk to myself just to just to talk to myself. It'd be weird. Stage traffic, Skyline 4953 Tango, 10 mile final, RNAV 35 approach. Bernie Stage. Alright, we're below 140. Gear coming down. One green, one in the mirror, one out the door. Do you see a wheel out on your side? Yep. Perfect. Sixty feet, one hundred feet to go. Got some ground scouter out the side window. Just like that, IFR flying. Yeah, we have the runway autopilot off. Time to land. Skyline 4953 Tango, cancel IFR, field in sight. 53 Tango, IFR cancellation is received. Thanks. Radar service terminated. Free exchange free. Have a good day. Good day, 53 Tango. Pretty cool, huh? That's super cool. <laughs> right, down the middle. Cross 
Squad at or above 3,000 for R&A of 1-6 Lakeway. We're descending, not to Romeo Kilo. As heavy as this plane is, I always like to land with a little bit of power. Just helps cushion it, and I can keep the uh, the nose wheel up. Flaps up. That was your first IFR flight in a small airplane. It's great, man. That was pretty cool, wasn't it? <laughs> super cool. <laughs> You're in yeah. the clouds, you break out, and then boom, there's the runway. There's the runway. That's awesome. I'm glad we did it. Yeah. I know we were, we were, we were a little iffy about it, and we are like, eh, maybe we should. Shouldn't, no. Hey, let's just go see what happens. Yeah. But it was totally worth it, man. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And when we fly with good weather, it's going to be like boring. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, Instrument really flying to me, Robert, is, is is the most fun weather, you know? Yeah. I mean, you really don't want to push it in really crappy, excuse me, crappy stuff, but like this right here, this is what makes it fun, you know? This is why you get that instrument rating, you know, so you can, so you can do stuff like this. Man, that was cool. Yeah, that was. Awesome. I even put the smile on my face. You yeah. know, as many times as I as I've done these approaches, I mean, that's that's just so cool. You know, you break out, yeah, and boom, there's a runway. All right. Go. Well, that was Grand bars. Thank you. That was good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Glad thank we you, did man. it. Thank you. Thank you, man. Absolutely, brother. That was awesome. All right. Flight plans closed. Throttle to idle. Electrical and avionics will turn off. We'll let the turbocharger cool for about three minutes. Mixture to idle cutoff. Magnetos, magnetos and masters. All right. We're moving. Yeah, I guess these planes are so light that you can move by hand. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that Jason is getting soaked out there, but... I mean, it's not raining that hard. Yeah, that was definitely the coolest flight, and, and I thought we were not gonna be able to fly it because of the weather, but it worked out. Yeah, this is like threading a needle, because the, 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 the plane barely fits in here. All right, that flight made us really hungry. So we're gonna go to this place called Rudy's, and uh, yeah, Rudy's Barbecue. So this is the first one. This is the original the one. The original up. one. Uh, you would have to research when the first one opened up, but it's mm -hmm. this was the original. Like we were saying on the drive, it's become a little more commercialized over the years, but it's still pretty quality barbecue mm -hmm. um, yeah, for, for South good. Texas. It smells yeah. good from out here, so it's good. I do, I'd like. You got, the, uh, you got the first round at the house. That's something that you might want to put in, your, in the camp. The rub, uh, the rub and their, their, their barbecue, the barbecue sauce. sauce. Mm. You That's want good. that like the sausage cut? Yes, please. Okay. Oh, the anticipation. That brisket looks delicious. Perfect amount of fat. Mm, take a look at that brisket. All right, Jason, for you? Jason, that was the best brisket <laughs> I've ever had. Man, what can I say? I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, that was, a that good was meal. awesome. Good morning. Did I mention I mooch docked with Jason and Misty last night? Well, wasn't that great? This uh, this stop here in San Antonio. 
different, totally different part of San Antonio that we saw with that plane flight with uh, with Jason with using the you know the, the instruments uh, for landing. That, that was that was really cool. And uh, the barbecue. Oh, I think that's the best. The best. I don't know. It's right there with the Salt Lake. Probably one of the best barbecues I've had in Texas, and definitely one of the best. Probably definitely the best brisket I've ever had. That that's, that that was delicious and marbled and oh beautiful. And such flavor. And now we continue the journey to the west. That that was. Like, I mean, this this has been like a, it's kind of like the halfway point. Probably a little past the halfway point. I would have to like do math, but. Uh, yeah, now we now as you can see we are going into hill country here uh, a little bit. It's a beautiful part of the trip. I'm, I'm kind of you know bummed out that it's a, such an, an ugly day, but I think it's gonna get better uh, progressively as we as we continue going to the west. So um, yeah, enjoy the ride. I'm probably gonna we're probably gonna stay at Van Horn. If I can make it a little farther than Van Horn, I will. But let's face it, uh, we left at. Um, 10, 10 a.m. so it's, it's it's kind of a late start. We continue tackling the second half of our westerly trek. This is actually my third time making this January trip to Quartzsite. And while the first half uh, I almost could have done without, well, you saw it. This second half never gets old. The gradual change in landscape is so subtle that it is almost imperceptible. How the vegetation slowly becomes shorter, sparser, and all of a sudden, you look around and come to the realization that you've finally left the eastern United States and are slowly approaching the unique landscapes afforded by the West. We're getting there, folks. We're getting there. But more about that on the next episode. Until then, thank you so much for watching. And see you on the road.